America's Heartland is made possible by Farm Credit, financing agriculture and rural America since 1916. Farm Credit is cooperatively owned by America's farmers and ranchers. Learn more at farmcredit.com. Crop Life America, representing the companies whose modern farming innovations help America's farmers provide nutritious food for communities around the globe. Hi, I'm Sarah Gardner. Let's take you cross country on America's heartland this time to find out more about rice. It's a grain playing a larger and larger role in snack foods, ethnic dishes, and in crops, bringing in some big bucks for American agriculture. We'll meet an Arkansas farmer who took on the challenge of growing a special kind of rice to tap into markets overseas. These rice fields in Louisiana grow not only rice, but bright red crawfish. Our farm to fork chef, Sharon Vaknin joins us with a rice recipe that could be a big favorite around your house. And we'll take you to California, where young students join rice farmers in a project to protect baby ducks. It's all coming up on America's Heartland. You can see it in the eyes of every woman and man in America's Heartland, living close to the land. There's a lot and a pride in the brand in America's heartland living close close to the land When it comes to crops in the heartland, these fields of green are some of the most striking. We're in the heart of California rice country. We're still several weeks away from harvest, but the rice here will eventually make its way to your dinner table and to consumers overseas. Rice is an important dietary staple in many parts of the world and growing more and more popular in the United States. Americans are consuming three times the amount of rice they ate 40 years ago. Now, you may only associate rice with ethnic dishes or Asian cuisine, but you'll find the grain in rice cakes, snack chips, breakfast cereals, even beer. And if you're one of a growing number of people looking for foods that are gluten-free, then rice fits the bill, which is why more and more rice products are trumpeting their benefits to consumers. Rice was first cultivated in Asia and planted in this country on farms in the south as far back as the late 1600s. An early variety called Carolina Gold is still produced today. But let's give you another angle on rice farming that you may never have thought about. Rob Stewart takes us to Louisiana where rice fields are also home to a bright red crustacean. On any day between October and June, you're likely to find multiple members of the Benoit family working the fields on their Louisiana farm, calling in a catch of red swamp crawfish. Crawfish really is a way of life here in Louisiana, isn't it? It's a big part of our life. Yeah. What would you do without it? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I've been doing it over 30 years. Crawfish have been harvested in the Bayou State since the 1880s, but real production didn't begin until the 1960s when farmers began reflooding rice fields to encourage a crawfish habitat. We enjoy it. My wife enjoys it. She runs ponds. You can see my grandkids, they enjoy it. My son's in it. And hopefully even my younger uh, grandkids are going to get into it. Hurricanes Katrina and Rita in 2005 affected both crawfish production and demand. Yields have rebounded in recent years, cementing Louisiana's position as the number one producer of crawfish in the United States. Using a boat powered by a hydraulic wheel, the Benoits farm a thousand acres, about three hours west of New Orleans. The crawfish are captured in baited pyramid traps, then transferred to 30-pound sacks. On a good day, the family will harvest four to 600 pounds of crawfish. The amount of crawfish they catch depends in part on how much rain falls, because the pregnant females bury themselves beneath the soil and only reemerge with their young when the rice fields are reflooded in the fall and winter months. They're gonna come back at the end of September, November, with young ones on, under the tail. Hopefully they can drill down deep enough to have an adequate water supply 
where it can stay and stay through a dormancy till we get the right rain in September and October to come up. It's not a perfect crop, uh, mainly because the hard part is you can't see it. It's not like putting a rice seed out there or soybean seed where you can go right there and check on it. But you know, you find what works for you and, and you just kind of stick with it. And uh, hopefully you do well enough to keep everything going. It may be hard work, but the fishing business has already lured Donald's grandson to become a third generation farmer. So tell me about what you hope to bring to this farming operation. I just plan to do what my grandpa does and maybe expand a little bit, just try to make a career out of crawfish farming. Mm -hmm. When you say expand, what do you mean? I mean, maybe appeal more, try to get more business, you know, it's always good to make more money. Mm -hmm. So. And have you, you know, you're going to college, but you have really learned so much. Oh yeah, I've been around the farm all my life. I've been doing this. I couldn't see myself doing anything else. Even younger brother Gavin, who's been doing much of the heavy lifting on this harvest, finds the job to be fun. I enjoy this because you really get to hang out with your family and friends, and it just means a lot to me. The Benoits also rotate crops by planting rice in some of their fields, since the flat, flooded areas work well for both crawfish and rice production. And because rice fields must first be flooded and then drained for harvest, this mimics the cycles of natural watersheds where crawfish can thrive. A lot of crawfish ponds are rotated behind rice. You do rice and you come in with the crawfish. This is a permanent pond which there's going to be no rice planted for harvest. Uh, you know, we're going to clean it up, maybe throw a little green rice in there. I mean by green rice, it's rice you plant in uh, August or September. It's rice just for crawfish, it's not for harvest. After the crop is harvested, it's trucked to a processing plant where the crawfish are ready to be prepared for market. First, they're weighed, then steamed, and peeled. Hundreds of pounds of crawfish tail meat are prepared each day in this one plant alone. In 2010, farmers in the state raised more than 100 million pounds of crawfish, worth $168 million. The finished product is then sealed into one pound bags, where it's shipped to supermarkets, restaurants, and sold to customers. I need three crawfish eggs if to go. Locally, the crop becomes the catch of the day at Johnny's Drive-In, where it's served over a bed of rice with a side of fried catfish and all the fixings. All right, everybody, let's eat. You can call them crawfish, crayfish, or mud bugs. There are some 350 varieties of crawfish in the United States. And how's this for patriotic? Crawfish come not only in a red species, but also white and even blue. You know, I mentioned earlier that Americans are consuming more than three times the amount of rice they did 40 years ago. But even with those numbers, about half the rice raised in this country makes its way to consumers overseas. But getting a crop into overseas markets can be a challenge for American farmers. We met one farm family in Arkansas who met that challenge. It's a familiar sound during rice planting season, aerial spraying on this family's fields of grain. And on the Isbell Farm near England, Arkansas, there's also the sound of music. Gathering the family together in music and song has become a tradition when celebrating a new silo on the farm. We share everything, and it's, um, it's been a real blessing to have uh, our family so close. Once this silo finishes holding a note, it will begin holding rice. But not just any rice, a very special variety of rice favored by customers in Japan. The rice is sweet and it's smooth on your tongue. And when you bite it, it doesn't quite bite into you, but it springs back. Arkansas farmers planted more than 1.3 million acres of rice in 2008, 
mostly long and medium grain varieties. But the Isbell family also raises a special variety, once only found in Japan. That effort sprung from a 1988 conversation with a Japanese rice expert. He was telling me about the differences in the rice in Japan. He was telling me that uh, one rice was better grown in the northern part, one in the southern part. And, and he asked me about Arkansas, and I told him as far as I knew, you know, you just put gravy on it and eat it. And then he said, but you can't grow that in the United States. And so I just said to myself, I bet you can. So Chris and his father Leroy successfully planted test plots of Kasha Hikari rice. They had a taste test and had the Japanese rice and then the then, uh, American rice. <clears throat> and they all checked it, you know, and Chris's rice come out first. Changes in trade laws ultimately opened Japanese markets to the family's rice, and the Isbells gained celebrity status overseas. But growing the specialty crop demands exacting attention to fertilization and protein levels. I know Japanese rice is a finicky type of crop to grow. What are some of the challenges that you've had? It has a weak straw. When it matures, it falls over. And that's a difficult thing. We have, the, we have specialized equipment to deal with that, but it's still not fun. Flat fields in natural wetlands encourage rice production in Arkansas. Farmers flood fields to control weeds and protect soil nutrients. Managing levees is, is very time consuming when you farm a lot of ground. That's about all you do. That's the biggest part of growing rice is managing the water. To alleviate that concern, laser technology is used to level the tiered fields, clearing the way to improve production. And with planting, spraying, harvesting, and marketing, it's an operation that involves every member of the Isbell family. We're so close. Everybody uh, feels everyone else's pain because we're all in the same boat. So far, that boat's been good sailing for a family that took a chance on a new crop. A happy ending that strikes just the right note. in part to crop science. World rice production has more than doubled in the past 40 years, and rice is versatile. In addition to food, rice and its byproducts are used for making rope, paper, wine, cosmetics, and even toothpaste. Well, we've talked about rice on your dinner table, so let's check in with our Sharon Vaknin. She's sharing some ideas where rice is taking center stage on the menu. Rice is a staple in any household, but it's usually just a boring side dish. With over dozens of varieties to choose from, basmati, short grain, long grain, rice can actually be the star of a meal. We're making hearty rice stuffed Cornish game hens roasted on a bed of rice. Then for dessert, we're making my take on rice pudding. First, we need to prep the ingredients for stuffing the Cornish game hens. So I've got half an onion here. Throw these guys in the pan. And we want to get this to a point where the onions are nice and brown. All right, we'll let those settle in. And now let's get started on our garlic. All right, we're also going to add some carrots. Our onions are brown, so we'll throw in our carrots and garlic. And at this point, we want to add our spices so that they can bloom a little bit in the pan before the rice goes in. So we'll add cumin, cinnamon, little red pepper flakes. And as soon as they hit the pan, you can smell all those exotic spices. And now we'll throw in our dried fruits. And here you can get creative. I'm using dried cranberries and golden raisins, but even dried apricots would be good here. Raisins, regular raisins would be good too. 
I'm also throwing in pistachios, another place you can get creative. So sliced almonds are good, walnuts would also be great. Whatever you have in the pantry will probably work here. That's why I love this dish. Now that all of these ingredients have mingled, we can throw in our brown rice. So I've already cooked one cup of brown rice in chicken stock. So since it's cooked with chicken stock, it's actually got a nice color too. But it's also going to pick up all of those spices and flavors from these ingredients. The difference between short grain and long grain is that short grain has a lot more starch. So it tends to be creamier and it tends to stick together, whereas long grain is a little fluffier. So our stuffing is actually all set and we can get ready to stuff our Cornish hens. All right, so I've brought these Cornish game hens to room temperature and now it's time to stuff them. So our rice stuffing has cooled. We'll go ahead and start piling it in. We'll hit them with a little salt, pepper, a little bit of paprika too. Hit them with a little olive oil and then a little massage before they go into the oven. All right, so we'll fill in all of these gaps with our rice. On top go our hens, right on top of these onions. The idea is that they're not sitting in the chicken stock, which we are adding to the rice so that it doesn't dry out. So now we'll put this in the oven at 400 degrees until these juices run clear, about 40, 45 minutes. So while our Cornish game hands are roasting, it's time to make our rice pudding. And I promised it would be my take on rice pudding, and you'll see why in just a moment. But first, we need to continue cooking this arborio rice. I already prepared about a cup and a half of rice here, and now I'm going to add milk. I'm using 2% milk, but you can use whole milk or even skim milk if you want to. And to that, because it's rice pudding after all, we'll add a little bit of sugar. Okay, so that'll come to a simmer. It'll simmer for about 20 minutes until the rice has soaked up all of the milk. Meanwhile, we'll work on the topping. So what we're making are caramelized peaches. Quarter our peaches, and now we'll coat them with a little butter. That will add sugar, cinnamon, and vanilla. That's mixed, so now we'll put it into this little cast iron dish. And while our rice continues to cook, we'll throw these peaches in the oven, 400 degrees, until it's nice, caramelized, and brown. All right, so the Arborio rice did its job and all of that sugar and milk is absorbed. Now we need to add two more ingredients. We're going to add one egg. To that we'll add half a cup of milk and it'll go straight into the rice pudding. So the milk and the eggs are all absorbed, which means our rice pudding is ready. So we've made our rice pudding using arborio rice for its starchiness and creaminess, topped it with a delicious roasted peach. And of course, we've got our Cornish game hens stuffed with rice, roasted on a bed of rice. And I have to tell you, it looks and smells amazing. And I think we can agree, we've proven that rice can be the star of any meal. So let's dig in. Dessert first. We began the show with the harvest of those bright red crawfish in the rice fields of Louisiana. Let's take you to another rice field, this one here in California, where the search is on for something quite different. It's an animal welfare effort by one family farm to protect some of our feathered friends. Who is from Mr. Hill's Shasta class? Oh, right on. These yeah. fifth grade what? students are getting ready for an egg hunt, unlike anything they've ever seen at Easter time. We call it egg aid. It is rescuing eggs from getting tired of, of 
destroyed as we start farming. The official egg aid, like today with the kids, started maybe 12 years ago when we said, what a great opportunity to be able to show local kids how the environment and farming really can interact with each other and it can be really positive for both. The egg aid hunt is taking place on the Lundberg family rice farm near Marysville in Northern California. The young students use noisemakers to flush out mallard ducks that nest in the cover crops planted on the farm after the autumn rice harvest. The cover crops are a great place for the ducks to, to, to want to nest. And so over the years, we thought it really would be wonderful if we could um, rescue those eggs and not just mow them down. And, and, um, and so it's been part of our approach is to rescue as many of those eggs as possible. Good job, baby! That's a nice one. Working in groups, the school kids search through 15 acres of the Lundberg farm. As the youngsters move through the grasses, they locate eight mallard nests, saving some five dozen duck eggs. This one here was probably made this morning. This is here a couple days before. It's really rough, and just to say that, to be prepared, because it's fun, but it's also really, really, it takes some really hard work. I found a nest and there was only one egg in it. It made me feel happy because I could still at least find one, but I was kind of disappointed because I couldn't, because there wasn't more. Look, you guys, we got 11! But these youngsters aren't the only ones on the hunt for wild duck eggs. The Lundberg field crews will also carry out searches as they move across the farm's 600 acres in their regular daily work. We would uh, prepare our fields in the spring and we would have our guys, as they would work each day, they could get off the tractors if they flushed a, a female duck and they'd collect the eggs and then they carry egg cartons with them in the tractors and they could put the eggs in the cartons. Over the years, the egg aid effort has grown, including not only school children, but participation by members of the local wild duck egg salvage program and the California Department of Fish and Game. All right, we saved three. But there's more than just a benefit for the birds. This unique search also provides a learning experience for the students. They learn a lot of lessons. They learn a little bit about hard work. They learn a little bit about the community because we do have a lot of agriculture around here and some of them don't come into contact with it almost at all. So it's just a really nice outreach where kids can see this is how you produce food, this is how wildlife interacts with agriculture, and there's things that you can do if you're aware of how things interface together. There's no fences here. The birds fly in, the birds fly out, and we really have a responsibility to be stewards. Kind of uh, grouping the eggs together, there's three different nests here. There's a nest of three, and a nest of one, and another nest of three. Once saved from the fields, the wild duck eggs move to the next step in the animal rescue effort, ending up at one of the federally regulated hatcheries in the region. Patrick Marmon and his wife Terry operate Pacific Valley Ranch near Marysville, where they raise hundreds, sometimes thousands of wild ducks each year. There we have the birds that'll go out tonight. They'll be on their feet by the night and ready to go. I leave them in this hatcher for about 12 hours after they hatch. The ducklings spend about a week in a brooding box. Because they're born without a mother, this allows their bodies to develop the natural oils that protect them while they're swimming. And from there, they spend the next four weeks maturing. She's quacking now. But before the ducks are released back into the wild, federal law requires that they be banded and their sex recorded. We've probably banded and released 100,000 birds, or, or very close to it. Then, it's back to the Lundberg farm where 200 acres have been set aside as a wildlife habitat. We like to release them at five weeks. They're yet a week and a half from flying and they have time to imprint on the habitat we release them in, and most of the hens will come back next year and lay in this very habitat. The hope is that the ducks will see the protected marshland as home, returning here after migration instead of the rice fields. And it's showing some really good success because uh, the bands are coming back showing that these birds are integrating into wild populations. You guys find it? Oh my God. Guys, I think it's in here. 
Those taking part see ag aid as the kind of cooperative effort that farmers and environmentalists can successfully carry out, bringing with it an activity that also lets youngsters focus on the future. They learn what's, what's around them. They learn about helping someone outside of themselves. There's some environmental science here too. And so it's a pretty unique opportunity to combine all those things into one. Just a reminder, we have lots more information about American agriculture on our website, including video from this or other shows. Just log on to americasheartland.org. And of course, there's lots going on in our social media arena. You'll find us there as well. We'll see you next time on America's Heartland. You can purchase a DVD or Blu-ray copy of this program. Here's the cost. To order, just visit us online or call 888-814-3923. You can see it in the eyes of every woman and man in America. Living close to the land. There's a love for the country and a pride in the brand. In America's heart, man. Living close, close to the land. America's Heartland is made possible by Farm Credit, financing agriculture and rural America since 1916. Farm Credit is cooperatively owned by America's farmers and ranchers. Learn more at farmcredit.com. Crop Life America, representing the companies whose modern farming innovations help America's farmers provide nutritious food for communities around the globe.